All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Vito Abenanti. Uh, our unit is Baker Company, 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. Uh, the 101st Airborne took place in uh, major battles during World War II, Normandy Invasion, uh, Operation Market Garden, and of course everybody knows the Battle of the Bulge. What we have here today is some basic uh, equipment and information about what we took part, the 101st took part uh, in uh, three major campaigns during World War II. That was uh, the Normandy Invasion, Operation Market Garden, everybody knows as D-Day, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Operation um, Overlord, which was the invasion uh, on D-Day, Operation Market Garden, which was the aerial invasion of Holland, and also the Battle of the Bulge. So what we have here is a basic equipment um, load for paratroopers during World War II. During World War II, paratroopers were um, new to combat. It was something that had never been tried before. The, uh, the Russians were actually the very first to um, start airborne operations. Uh, the Germans uh, took that innovation and took it further. But uh, during World War II, it was really the Americans and the British that um, you made the most use of airborne troops for major campaigns. Um, so what we can do is we can go around and we can show uh, some of the equipment. Let's start with this. This is basically a basic layout of what was called the T-5 rig. The T-5 rig was the basic parachute that U.S. troops do, used during the war. It had a main canopy and it had a reserve um, included with, uh, for all the equipment that the paratroopers carried during World War II for the Normandy drop. Uh, if you included shoot, parachutes, reserve chute, weapons, food, ammo, cigarettes, uh, the average load for the Normandy invasion was between 140 to 160 pounds. Now, when you take into consideration that the average airborne paratrooper uh, during World War II uh, was between five foot six and five foot ten and weighed between 140 to 160 pounds. So when you see videos of the paratroopers getting into the uh, into the aircraft, um, uh, old uh, movies of it, and they're kind of pushing and you know lifting each other into the aircraft, that is actually very true. Um, they literally carried their body weight, which is included also water, food, knives, cigarettes, um, and anything that would basically they felt that they would need for the um, the campaign that was um, uh, to take place in Normandy. Uh, the Normandy campaign was expected to have paratroopers in combat three to three to five days. Uh, casualties were expected to be anywhere between 80 to 85 percent. That means that every out of every 10 paratroopers that jumped into Normandy, they expected eight of them to either be uh, killed, wounded, or captured. Let's start with the basic rifle. The basic rifle used by the U.S. Army during World War II was the M1 Garand. It's a 30 out caliber, 30 out six, semi-automatic, clip-fed, gas-operated rifle. It was the first semi-automatic rifle to come into service with any standing army coming into service with the United States Army in 1936. It, this was the weapon that the majority of GIs carried. Next one would be, this is an M1 carbine. This particular model is, it has a paratrooper folding stock which was designed so tro paratroopers can stow it and carry it easy. Um, it was mostly designed to be issued to what was called, um, well, basically for machine gun crews, mortar crews, uh, maybe officers, anybody that did not need to carry the full uh, M1 Garand, but still needed a firearm. This was smaller, lighter, fired a smaller round, but still an effective rifle. Now, what we have here, this is an M1 Thompson. M1, the Thompson submachine gun is a 45 caliber, full auto, a magazine fed, 
submachine gun. What that means is that it fires a pistol round as opposed to a rifle round. The uh, 19, the Thompson itself came into service with the United States Army at the end of World War One, and um, it went through ver different versions to eventually this particular model. This particular model is the M1 Thompson. This was uh, designed to be used by the U.S. Army. It was uh, cheaper to manufacture. It didn't. It only used thick magazines. Still fired a 45 caliber round has a fire, rate of fire of about 750 rounds per minute, has a maximum effective range of about 250 yards. Um, another weapon that uh, sometimes was used, mostly by rear echelon troops, was the, the uh, 1907? Uh, model 1897. A, model 1897 shotgun. The shotgun was mostly used by uh, rear echelon as for uh, MPs for security. A lot of times, if, if for MPs, if they were guarding prisoners, they would carry one of these. Uh, by the Geneva Convention, these were not allowed into combat, um, and were all, so therefore were not used by infantry combat units. They were mostly, as I said, these were used mostly by rear echelon, and majority of the time they were used by military police. Another rifle that was also used during World War II was the 1903 Springfield. Now the 1903 was also used during World War I. It is a same as the M1 Garand. It is a 30-06 caliber uh, rifle. It is a bolt action rifle. That means every time you needed to load around, you had to physically pull back the bolt and load it. You gotta push the spring down. So each time you needed to fire around, you would pull back the bolt, the bolt would throw out the spent round, and you would load a new round. It would hold the ma as an internal magazine of five rounds, as opposed to the M1 Garand, which had a clip that held eight rounds. Um, now that's what they call an M-block. As you can see, it's, it, it feeds directly into the top of the M1, and it holds eight rounds. And when the eight rounds are fired, it just spits it out. Um, now also over here, what we have is some other equipment. We have some German captured German weapons, which would be the K-98, which was the standard rifle used by the German army. As a matter of fact, that one was the, the German army used the K-98 in one version or the other all the way through World War I and World War II. Same thing as the uh, 1903 Springfield. It has the same type of action. You pull back to load around and push the bolt forward to, lo to load the round. It, it's a very basic action. A lot, of comp a lot of countries actually use the same basic bolt action. It, it, it was used by the Germans. It was used by the uh, British, it was used by the Americans, it was used by the French. It's a basic design that was used by pretty much all the countries. Um, also what they carried at, during World War II is what is a 9mm. They had the same thing as, as, the, as the Thompson. It's a 9mm. Uh, difference was this was a 9mm instead of the 45. It's called an MP40, uh, what a lot of people incorrectly refer to as a Schmeisser. The reason why they call it a Schmeisser, Schmeisser is because the company that made the magazines was called Schmeisser, and they not automatically connected the magazine to the right to the uh, rifle itself. Is a um, it's a nine millimeter, fires uh, roughly about the same kind of rate and distance as the Thompson. Um, once again, also used um, quite often by the by the German army. Uh, very reliable, very dependable weapon. As you can see, there's a there's their main chute, which is this is a T5 chute. Then you also have a reserve chute. The difference between the T5 is, and the reserve is T5 is about a 25 foot canopy. The reserve is about a 20 foot canopy. The purpose of the reserve was that if you had any malfunctions or any problems with the main parachute itself, that the purpose of it was you would release the main chute and hopefully you would still have enough time to engage. The reserve chute. Now the problem was that for 
um, for Normandy especially, uh, combat drop drops were uh, much lower. A lot of the um, a lot of the parachute paratroopers jumped uh, the the standard uh, altitude for a combat jump was 500 feet uh, because of the fact that they had a lot of new pilots that were flying to transport aircraft they'd never been in a combat before. Uh, they took evasive action once the they came over the French coast and the Germans started firing anti-aircraft at them. Some of them flew higher, some of them flew lower, some of them flew flat faster, some of them flew slower. So that created a lot of issues and, and a lot of uh, paratroopers jumped from as low as 350 feet. Uh, a lot of them barely had enough time to engage their chute uh, before they hit the ground. A brief history of the 101st Airborne Division. The 101st actually traces its heritage all the way back to the Civil War. Uh, the uh, 101st Infantry Division was actually a National Guard unit stationed uh, from Wisconsin, uh, roughly in the Milwaukee area. Uh, if you look at the patch, the 101st Airborne patch has uh, a, a, an eagle on a black background. Now the eagle is nicknamed Old Abe. And the reason why it's nicknamed Old Abe is that um, the, uh, uh, the, the infantry unit, uh, to pay homage to uh, President Lincoln, basically named their mascot, which is the Eagle, uh, Old Abe. As a matter of fact, uh, the 101st uh, Air Mobile Division, which is what the, the current designation for the 101st Airborne Division uh, is, uh, is actually still has an Eagle as a mascot and has had one throughout the, the, its entire history. Um, a lot of, a lot, uh, of people uh, argue about uh, which unit in the United States Army was designated as an airborne unit. Some, you know, uh, some claim that the 82nd Airborne became, uh, was airborne before the 101st. This is not correct. Both the 101st Infantry and the 82nd Infantry were designated airborne at the same time, uh, roughly in June of 1942. Now, the 82nd Airborne Division has a, a, also has a very long and, and, and storied history. Uh, if anybody remembers or anybody's ever heard of Sergeant York, uh, Sergeant York uh, was a highly decorated um, member of the 82nd Infantry Division during World War I. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he, uh, there's been movies made about him with, um, uh, I, forget, I forget the name of the actor, but uh, um, he was actually as a member of the 82nd Infantry Division. Now, the 82nd Infantry Division did go into combat first, uh, taking part in operations in, in uh, North Africa and Sicily and Italy, uh, while the 801st Airborne Division, first time in the combat during World War II, was uh, the uh, D-Day landings uh, in 1944. But um, as, as a lot of, uh, as if you look at the history, the 101st has a very storied history during World War II. Um, and I'm sure everybody, you know, has heard of D-Day. Not so many people have heard of Operation Market Garden, uh, but everybody's heard of you know, the Battle of the Bulge. I, I think the Battle of the Bulge is um, pretty much the battle where, where the 101st gained its reputation and, you know, it got, became folklore um, just for what they did to uh, defend and secure Bastogne during the battle.